Warning. This site is for SCP personnel with O5 approval. Access beyond this point for those with standard level 4 security is prohibited, and may result in termination of Foundation employment. Unauthorized visitors who survive the memetic kill agent are detained and interrogated under truth-exacting memetic agents. Dr. Herman Wright was used to high security protocols. He had been working with the SCP Foundation for several years, and had dealt with specimens both terrifying and valuable. But something about this site was different. The security was tighter than he'd ever seen. And it all seemed a bit too much for what looked like a run-of-the-mill warehouse in Alexandria, Egypt. The street seemed normal. It was surrounded by businesses selling food and clothes, and none of the locals seemed to give a second glance. But as soon as he was approved for access and entered the warehouse, it was a very different story. He looked into the Cognito Hazard testing screen, designed to cause psychic damage to anyone who hadn't been inoculated by the Foundation, and entered the large bunker. Automated guns lined the walls. He could see the outlines of trap doors below him, and he was pretty sure the whole place was rigged to blow if a large-scale assault hit. The Foundation was taking no chance with whatever they had found in Egypt. What could they be keeping locked up below? As Dr. Wright walked through the long tunnel leading to the staircase, he could see a series of rules marked on the wall. No open flames allowed within SCP-4001. No firearms or bladed weapons allowed within SCP-4001. All writing utensils brought into SCP-4001 must be approved by a majority of the O5 Council. Violating these conditions could cause a CK-class restructuring scenario, or an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Dr. Wright's mind raced as he entered the massive antechamber and descended the staircase, but he wasn't prepared for what he saw. It was a library the biggest library he had ever seen. With bookcases stretched as far as the eye could see, the library was far bigger than the warehouse looked from the outside, and Dr. Wright assumed it must be a disguise built on top of the much bigger, older facility that had been discovered by the Foundation. It wouldn't be the first time the Foundation found something that didn't conform to the laws of Euclidean geometry. SCP locations often played by their own rules. As Dr. Wright exited the staircase and walked up to the first bookcase, he could swear he heard rustling sounds among the shelves. Was something moving? He hadn't seen anyone walking the aisles when he descended the staircase, and he was pretty sure he was alone here, wasn't he? Making things stranger, a quick look at the bookcase didn't show any books he was familiar with. None had standard titles. In fact, they all seemed to follow a simple format each title a different individual person. All books look the exact same. Same binding, same thickness, same number of pages. Was this some sort of SCP reference library? Suddenly, a hand slapped down on Dr. Wright's shoulder and his heart nearly jumped out of his chest. He turned to see a gray-haired man in an SCP lab coat extending a hand to him. Dr. Waylon Henricks, chief scientist in charge of testing at SCP-4001. You must be Dr. Wright. He didn't give Dr. Wright a chance to respond. Dr. Henricks didn't seem like the kind of man to be very interested in what others had to say. Yes, yes. About time the Foundation sent me a new research assistant. I suppose you have a lot of questions. Dr. Wright was supposed to be a researcher, not an assistant. He didn't suppose it would do any good to point that out. When Dr. Wright tried to question what it was that he'd be researching, Dr. Henricks told him that it would be easier to show than explain. With that, he motioned Dr. Wright to a nearby table, where one of the countless identical books on the shelves was waiting. He nodded at the book, prompting the younger doctor to turn it over and read the title. He couldn't believe what he saw. There on the front of the book was his name, Herman Wright. Dr. Wright looked at his colleague in confusion, and Dr. Henricks motioned for him to take a look. It was written in a language that he had never seen before but was somehow instantly recognizable and understandable. And the book really was about him. Every detail of his life had been written down in this volume, starting with his birth, containing details that no one but he knew. His whole life story was here. From his childhood to his education to his eventual recruitment by the SCP Foundation. But the book wasn't completed. The last line that had been written described his entry into the secured confines of SCP-4001 that very day. Dr. Henricks had a mad glint in his eye. Are you starting to understand? One for each of us. 
Every person who has ever lived, roughly 120 billion people since the dawn of man, their lives all written down in these books. Every time someone is born, their book appears in this library, and their story gets written as it happens. The Foundation has been monitoring this site since the 1800s, but it's been operating much longer than that, since the dawn of recorded history. Dr. Henricks passed Dr. Wright another book. It was simply titled, The Hunter, and it chronicled the life of a prehistoric man who spent his days searching for wild game. He lived 23 violent, monotonous years before his story ended abruptly when a saber-toothed tiger decided it was interested in the same mammoth he was hunting. This must have been one of the oldest books in the library. A book for every person on Earth. Dr. Wright could only imagine what the scale of this massive library must be. Dr. Henrik explained that mapping the library was a huge challenge before producing a map from his pocket and laying it out on the desk. You're at base camp. This is where new births generate on the shelves along with books pertaining to the first humans. If you want to drag down specific books, you'll need to know where you're going. We've established base camps around the library to mark significant eras in human history with notable books. At each camp, you'll find generators, supplies, and beacons to light your way. If you're going back far enough, you could be traveling for days or even weeks. Dr. Wright was fascinated by this bizarre location, containing the sum total of human experience within its massively expanding walls. But there was one thing he couldn't figure out. Just why was this seemingly harmless location featuring constantly changing books the most securely guarded SCP he had ever encountered? Dr. Henricks knew he was referring to the extensive rules he had must have seen as he entered. The other doctor reached into his pocket and said, Let's just say that around here, the pen is mightier than the sword. He pressed the pen into Dr. Wright's hand and flipped open the back page of his book. It was blank the rest of his story waiting to be written. What's something you've always wanted in your life, Dr. Wright? Think literally. Why not put it in your book or remove something you've always wanted gone? Slowly, Dr. Wright thought back to his teenage years and recalled an injury that he suffered in a mugging that damaged his leg and left him with a limp. He nervously used the pen to scribble out the words and sentences describing the event. After a few seconds, he felt a headache and suffered from a slight nosebleed. After that, the limp and pain from the injury was gone, and he could no longer recall the event. You see, Dr. Wright, that's the secret of SCP-4001, Dr. Henrik said with a mad gleam in his eye. This library doesn't just let us read the history of humanity, it lets us write it. That's why you're here, to test the limit of this power and see what this library can do for the Foundation. Dr. Henrik soon provided Dr. Wright with footage of some of the many tests conducted in the library, and what Dr. Wright saw amazed him. The books could rewrite the laws of nature with alarming speed, as some unfortunate D-Class personnel found out. D-0546 was brought into a room with a full head of hair. The D-Class personnel was instructed to scribble, lost all hair into his book, and he soon started scratching his head as he rapidly started shedding hair. After less than two minutes, the man was completely bald. D-0567, a young woman who had been brutally injured when attacked by an escaping SCP, was bedridden and would never walk again, according to all the Foundation doctors. As the D-Class personnel used a pen to scribble over the line in her book describing her injury, Dr. Wright watched as she suffered a minor nosebleed and then sat up, getting out of bed as if she had never been injured and no longer remembered being attacked. Dr. Claire Williams, a Foundation researcher sick with cancer, wrote into the book about curing her symptoms, and then addressed the camera explaining that this was her third time altering her own book. Her lymphoma symptoms had returned after several months and two years, respectively, but it seemed that as long as she continued to make changes to her book, then she could keep the cancer at bay indefinitely. But not all the tests ended with positive results, as Dr. Wright moved on to another selection of tapes labeled Mortality Tests A D-Class personnel who was given a fatal dose of drugs and then had their death erased from their book 45 minutes later miraculously returned to life, but showed significant cognitive deficits after. Another D-Class, an older woman killed in a containment breach, had her death erased from the book, but came back deeply disturbed. She survived 15 days in containment, repeating, Send me back, let me go, over and over again before committing suicide. 
A D-Class personnel killed 28 days prior was brought back by writing, returned back to life in their book, but died again just 13 minutes later from a cerebral hemorrhage. But it was the next tape that was the most disturbing. It documented a new book that was written by the Foundation, depicting the life of a fictional man down to the slightest detail. It was carefully placed in the correct position in the archives, resembling all the other books. And Dr. Wright watched the tape in amazement as the man resembling the fictional character created for the book spontaneously generated in SCP-4001. Almost immediately, the man started vomiting blood and died less than two minutes later. The book carefully described all the things he died from, and stated that this was exactly as it was supposed to be. The fake book then disappeared into the archives, never to be seen again. The archive knew when it was being used to play with life and death, and it didn't want any part of it. The next tape wasn't a test at all. It was a video interview showing a Greek-speaking scientist speaking with an ancient-looking old man, found living in the archives slowly after its discovery by the Foundation. The man, who described himself as the Watcher of Alexandria Eternal, believed he was keeping the archives safe from the Roman Empire and the other invaders. He was unaware that thousands of years had passed since his watch began. He had been using the books to write himself another day of life, and to cure his ills ever since he began guarding the library. At the conclusion of the interview, he asked to leave, and this request was granted by the Foundation. The ancient man died of old age shortly after setting foot out of the library. While the library can't technically cure death, it does seem to have nearly limitless ability to prolong life, as long as someone is willing to stay close by and never forgets to write themselves another day. Where did this incredible power come from? An O5 authorized investigation into the origins of SCP-4001 revealed that under the archive's carpet is a concrete floor covered by a layer of ash. The ash was carbon dated to between 70 and 80,000 years old. And further analysis revealed the ash is likely to be the remains of burnt wood and paper, despite there being no known records within the archive itself about a major fire having occurred there. Dr. Wright didn't have much time to dwell on the library's great power of life, because he was suddenly shaken from his thoughts by the sound of alarms. Was the library being breached? No, it was Foundation officials, led by a man recognized as Dr. Lincoln Abrams, the very man who assigned him to this project and he did not look happy. He explained that he knew what Dr. Wayland Henricks had been up to, writing in books, changing the lives of subordinates in an attempt to play God. He knew about everything, of course, because he had read Dr. Henricks' own book. He knew all of the doctor's secrets. He knew everything. No, I'm so close, Dr. Abrams. I know I can crack the archive's rules. There's a way to conquer death here, I can feel it. Dr. Abrams was done listening and with a wave of his hand, Foundation Security took Dr. Henricks into custody for a debriefing and likely demotion. Dr. Abrams then turned his attention to the new young researcher. Dr. Wright, eventful first day, I gather. I'll appoint a new lead scientist shortly, but until then, don't disrupt anything. Remember, the Archive is writing our stories as we speak. It's not very happy with Dr. Henricks. Make sure your story turns out better. And with that, Dr. Abrams and his security team departed, leaving Dr. Herman Wright alone with the endless archives of Alexandria Eternal, wondering what would be written in his own tome, as the sound of new books popping into existence filled the air with ominous rustling.